Well, good to see you again this morning. Good to be uh, together to worship, and I think that's really should be our focus today. And it uh, it is great that we're able to join together to worship God in the freedom that we have, especially uh, on this day when we celebrate the birth of our nation. And as Americans, happy birthday! You're 244 years old. How about that? Can I get an amen? All right, great deal, good deal. You know, literally when we think about uh, the 4th of July and we think about the nation being birthed as formerly a nation, and of course if you really know your history, you know that a lot of folks had been here in, in, on this soil for a long time, hundreds of years before actually the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But those individuals who signed that Declaration of Independence, who gave us our freedom as a nation from the oppression and the, the tyranny that Britain was giving us at that time, they literally signed their lives or put their lives on the line. Uh, and, and I think, and, and to me, with everything going on in our nation in the last couple of weeks, it's really a little bit discouraging because of, of what people think their freedoms are. They think that they have a freedom to just do whatever they want. They have a freedom to think, to act. They have a freedom to think that somebody owes us something. And that's really not the case. And that's what breaks my heart because when you think about what this country was founded on and, and actually a lot of the freedoms that people were uh, spouting actually didn't come till many years later, a decade later, when the Bill of Rights actually amended uh, the Constitution, even after the Declaration of Independence. I mean, there's a lot of history that goes on, and people just really don't even, I think, understand what they proclaim. And, and that's really what I want to talk a little bit about today, because I've titled my message, Just Taking Freedom Out of Context. Taking freedom out of context. I think most of the times, we, even as believers sometimes, we want to quote the Bible and a lot of times we're uh, bad, and, and I hear it, and I know I, I've done it before, and, and the Lord has convicted me, so I'm real careful about Scripture verses we use to prove a point. In fact, it's almost I'm almost hesitant to say that I use the Bible to prove a point because that's really not what the Bible was designed for. The Bible was, yes, to give us knowledge. In fact, Psalm 110 I mean, 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and those who yield to his commands are, are, will find happiness. And again, he, he says in another psalm, in Proverbs as well, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Some places it says actually is the beginning of knowledge, of understanding. So what is this? And of course, when we're talking about the fear of the Lord, we're talking about reverence, reverencing God. Understanding who gives us really our innate freedom. And it doesn't come from some piece of paper that was signed a couple hundred years ago. It comes because of how God created us. And it comes really in the way God set this up. He gave us freedoms as human beings uh, under his power, under his wisdom. Uh, so again, we, I think we need to be careful, especially here lately with the freedom of speech deal that was going on. Man, that's to taken totally out of context. Uh, and, you know, it, to me it's just amazing how people will think. And, um, you know, I've even said it uh, as well. You know, by golly, I'm an American and, and it's my right. I can do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. But really it's not. There is nothing even in our Constitution that says that we can do that. And if you're a believer, shame on you because... Our main constitution, God's holy word, does not tell us that we can do that. Quite the opposite. So I want to look at, and my, my focal text today is really Leviticus 19, verse 18. And it just simply says, Do not take vengeance or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. And I encourage you to go back and read that this afternoon. Read Leviticus 19 packed full of a lot of, of, of just wisdom of how we should treat one another. But he starts it off with how we should treat God. Verse 1, he says, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. 
like I said, that's the whole emphasis behind the Ten Commandments that, that God gave. And down through chapter 19, he just gives example after example after example of right living. Right living before God and right living with fellow man. Right living with fellow man is going to give us a right standing and a right living among God. But in verse 16, he goes and says, Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Given everything that's been going on and, and hearing the news and hearing what people say, you know, really you can't expect anything different from non-believers. But friends, a lot of people that I see and I hear some things coming from are people who are professing to be believers, Christians. We need to be careful about what we say. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not jeopardize your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not harbor hatred against your brother. My goodness, God ranks hatred right up there with murder. I mean, it's the same. And physically, whether you do it or not, if you even just think about it, you've done it. He, t he, 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 he takes it so seriously. He takes it so seriously. Verse 18, again, do not take revenge or bear a grudge against a member of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what does it mean, again, and, and what does all this have to do with freedom? It really has everything to do with freedom. Because, again, when we uh, have that right understanding of God, we have that right understanding of our relationship with him, then we're going to start seeing that, yes, we're free. We'll see others in a free way. In fact, Jesus, the whole reason he came, God sent his son was for freedom. He set us free for freedom's sake. He wanted us to be free. That's the reason we were created that way. In fact, uh, that uh, the, it goes all the way back to those two greatest commandments. To, again, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your sign, or your soul, and love the neighbor as yourself. It was not and did not start with just the Bill of Rights that amended our Constitution. Again, it's right living. The way God had it set up was a forgiveness of sins to create freedom. And 1 Peter 4.8 tells us that it covers over a multitude of sins. Uh, and that's where uh, writer of Proverbs, he carries on that same thought. In uh, chapter 10, verse 12, hatred stirs up conflicts. And my goodness, have we seen that. Hatred in the heart. How, how it permeates a heart. There's no freedom in that. People think they're freedom to spout off, freedom to do whatever. Really, it's what's been happening in the world, and it's not just been in the last couple of weeks. It's not just been in the last couple hundred years with countries and nations. It's been going since mankind entered the pristine Garden of Eden. Hatred stirs up conflicts, but love covers all offenses. And again, we're called... To love we're called to love and again it doesn't matter where you are born where you're born we are called by God and as God's people and I'm gonna speak to us a little bit here believers we're called to be governed by his word by his word Peter tells us again in his first letter chapter 2 verse 16 he says submit as free people not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil just because you have the freedom to speak the truth doesn't necessarily mean you need to speak the truth to tear someone down, to be hurtful. Again, to speak the truth in love. Sometimes you may need to reword the truth so it doesn't come over like a sledgehammer. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. We are to submit to him in everything. That's the reason we're slaves to God. Verse 17, honor everyone, love the brothers and the sisters, fear God. And he closes it. Peter closes this statement with honor the emperor. Now, my goodness, what a, a fitting verse and reminder for us even today. And you may be saying, but Peter, you're not living under all this tyranny. You're not living under all these regulations where even the governor now is, is saying things and it makes us hard for us to worship. No, he wasn't. 
by, by this time, when Peter's writing this and writing this to believers, the believers were being killed and, and killed for their beliefs. He's writing to people who were fearing for their own lives, but yet finding peace in the middle of knowing that any moment, any day, someone could break into their house and drag them off for them to be killed. You know, again, it just all boils down to loving God and loving others. But we can't love God when we're God's enemies. And this is what we have to remember for those who are not believers. Now, again, I'm not giving excuses for anything. But unbelievers, we can't expect an unbeliever to act like a believer. I mean, my goodness, friends, let's be honest. Sometimes we have a hard enough time acting the way we're supposed to be acting. But again, they're in bondage. They're in bondage. They're in bondage of sin is what uh, the Bible tells us. In fact, Apostle John records Jesus' conversation to a bunch of religious leaders uh, over there in chapter 8. He says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And, of course, they come back with him and said, we're the descendants of Abraham. What are you talking about? We're not enslaved to anyone. How can you say that we'll become free? Because Jesus is talking about enslavement by sin. And this is what he says in verse 34. Jesus responded, truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin a slave does not remain in the household forever but a son does remain forever and he closes with that great verse that oftentimes is quoted so if the son sets you free church what will you be you will really be free or as i learned it free indeed you know the apostle paul he he said it uh, the similar way over in in Romans, and I know in the last few weeks, if you've been keeping up with some of our messages, I've been talking about Romans 7, where Paul really struggled with the commands and the statutes, and as a legal system, it's hard to do. And he struggled with, with doing right, and, and sometimes he knows he should be doing something, but he doesn't do it, and what he, he doesn't want to do, he does, and what he does, he doesn't want to do, and you know, just the struggle, the struggle with sin. But back up in chapter 6, verse 18, and he says, Having been set free from sin, you have been become enslaved to righteousness. Again, we have two masters. We have two rulers. One, it's either going to be sin or it's going to be God and righteousness. And that's what we as believers are called to. But it's not an enslavement that we're restricted. This freedom that, that Jesus gives us and that he's been talking about gives us a feeling and an actual reality of being so free. It's so lifting. It lifts your heart. It, this freedom melts that heart of stone that Ezekiel talks about and gives you a heart of flesh, uh, something that we need in order to serve and worship God. Paul, again, in writing to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 3.17, records him saying, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the great comforter. He is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You know, we can be free from so many things, free from pain, free from suffering. And that's not necessarily the physical uh, aspect of it. Yes, there's a lot of difficulty going on. Our dear brother, uh, Robert Feshman, went to be with Jesus uh, the day before yesterday. You know, he struggled in these last days with, with some physical ailments, just like we've lost some other loved ones in the last couple of months. And yes, I know the families and, and the friends would love to be free from the sadness, but it, it, it's hard. That's a reality. But even in the midst of that sadness, in the midst of that disappointment, even in the midst of discouragement, we can find freedom, a freedom that gives us joy, joy in our heart. And that's what's going to keep it alive. Because this world is going to beat us down. But we have to remember, this world is not our home. And, and I just give thanks to, uh, to Robert and like Dale that, that have passed on. And a friend of ours that uh, just, again, passed away from Hendersonville recently. Uh, she was even proclaiming uh, just the day before about how good God was. And she was so excited couldn't hardly speak because of struggling for breaths of air, but was proclaiming God's goodness and to be able to be in the home that Jesus Christ has prepared. 
But friends, while we're here, we're here to give a message. And that is that message of hope. That message, as, as Paul says, there is freedom. And again, that, that freedom is, is God's whole agenda. It's God's whole agenda for us to share what he has done for us. Paul tells the Galatians church, he says in chapter 5, verse 1, for freedom, Christ set us free. That's what I was saying at the very beginning. Do you get that? Even for freedom's sake, we've been set free. So we can have it. So what are we supposed to do with that freedom? Stand firm then and don't submit again to the yoke of slavery. It's so easy to yield and to fall into the temptations of, of the, the nature. You know, we can tell ourselves, and Satan is, is so subtle. Satan is, is such a schemer. He can get into our minds and, and cause us to be convinced of things. And, and again, if we don't take our thoughts captive, if we don't concentrate on God's Word, hide His Word in our hearts and constantly meditate on that, and we start looking around us, sure, we're going to see the waves and the, the storms of life, and it's going to cause us to have fear, and then we're going to start thinking all kinds of weird things and bad things about one another, and we're going to start substantiating that that they are really out to get us or they intend to do us harm. And, and again, our natural reflex is to take revenge. But as I said, vengeance is not ours. We are not to take revenge or bear a grudge on our neighbor. So I just have a question. Have you been set free from sin once and all, once for all? Have you accepted Jesus Christ, God's Son, who came into this world to set us free, to give us freedom that even a, a, a Declaration of Independence can't do? Even the Bill of Rights can't give us the freedom that changes a heart, that changes a destiny, that changes our home. Have you been set free? If not, admit. Admit that you are a sinner. And just confess your, son, your sins to God. Jesus Christ is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins. He tells us so. But believer, believer, if you have been set free, if you have been set free from your sins, how are you living? Are we living as free men and women? Are we living in a way and, and living in that freedom, proclaiming God's truth, not turning back to those evil ways, not submitting again to those evil, uh, that yoke, as Paul calls it, that yoke of sin. Don't let it jump on us. My goodness, many times we just put it on ourselves when we want to take up hatred, when we want to take up bitterness. When we're listening to that self-talk, that self-speak, we're just some of our own worst enemies. Lay it down. Lay it down. Hide God's Word in our heart. Take those thoughts captive. He's not telling us to take it captive and put it in a little box so we can have it right here to meditate on it. No, it's take it captive and do away with it and meditate on His Word wholly. Life is all about Jesus and glorifying Him. As I've said many times, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. When you realize this, we will truly be set free. Be set free and put freedom in its proper context. So let's be careful and let's encourage one another in love what having freedom means in the right context, in the right context. So again, these are weird times. It, it was not my desire to even have to come back outside. You know, I'm willing to do whatever to be able to help keep our people safe, to help uh, provide a means of, of worship. And we will be worshiping one way or another. Uh, there's nothing, and, and depending on, again, everybody's got different ideas about this virus and, and how we should act and, and how we should have precautions. But there are people that are getting sick. That's, it's a fact. We just want to make sure that we're safe. Let's love one another. Let's bear with one another. And let's make sure that we're glorifying God. And that means in our actions, that means in our words, that means in our day-to-day -day living, even at work, of how we're treating our neighbor, bearing up love with our neighbor. Of course, I do ask you to, to be in prayer for uh, Mary 
uh, fishermen. Um, they are to uh, make arrangements later on this afternoon. Uh, we'll be letting uh, some information, letting you all know about some information about Robert's services. Uh, they're really not sure. Um, just lift up Mary. She's going through a difficult uh, time right now, uh, and I know she would really uh, uh, covet your prayers, uh, covet your prayers. Her health is not really well either, uh, so again, just lift her up uh, in prayer, and, and especially uh, those of us who will be ministering to the family. Um, it's even hard. It's hard for us to even minister the way we want to uh, on, on both sides. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's seek his face in the true context of freedom. Father God, we thank you that you are the author of freedom. We thank you that you have created it for freedom's sake. You want us to be free. You want us to be able to revel in your wisdom. It's the what gives us wisdom. That wisdom ultimately tears down, breaks down, melts that very heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh, a tender heart. Lord, thank you that you have made such a way. And Lord, we thank you that you are, are, have sent your great comforter, not only as he counseling us as believers to walk with us in our day-to-day -day life, but he is the great comforter as well. For these difficult times when there are job losses, when there's unknowns with our jobs and difficulties with families, not to mention when our loved ones leave us here on this earth behind. Lord, our great comforter, we thank you for his ministry. May he just wrap his loving arms around Mary and those others of our loved ones who have recently lost loved ones to create, again, that joy that can only be found through you in such circumstances. Lord, we love you, and we honor and glorify your holy name. Amen. Thank you. 